Welcome back to another video, Peter here. Today's video is question answer video. I asked people to ask me questions on my Facebook page and also in the comments on my duty free video. I didn't do a specific video for questions, um, but yeah, we'll get into it. I did this video only once before at the beginning when I first started my channel. I think I had maybe six or 700 subscribers when I last did this and now I've got 7,000. So obviously a big chunk of my audience really doesn't know a whole lot about me um, because they probably haven't gone and watched the really old videos. So I'll probably do a question answer video just once a year because of the growth of the channel. And you know, it's good to do I think every now and again. Uh, I do get asked questions quite often. So actually, some of the questions I get asked quite often have not been asked in this video. One thing I get asked a lot is what watch I wear. It's made by Armani. Um, it's not made anymore, but you can still find it online. Uh, I think the, hold on, let me just check the code, the, the model number. It's AR1755 by Armani. For anyone that was curious, I, I get asked at least once a month which what model the watch is. Interestingly enough, well, I don't know if it's interesting. I'm just trying to get this back on. Um, but I am more picky with watches than I am with perfume. Like, seriously, this is the only the second watch I've ever owned in my entire life because I am so picky. I don't like metal uh, straps. I don't like fancy bling dials. I don't like Rolex or uh, Breitling or Amiga or all these kind of kind of fancy businessman watches. They, they don't suit me. I don't like the look of them. I like really thick, broad, dark brown leather straps. A nice, simplistic, but you know, nice style. Not over the top. I'm just super picky. I, you could give me five thousand different watches, and I would be surprised if there was two in there that I would want to wear. That's literally how picky I am. <laughs> so yeah, so that's the watch that I wear. I get asked that quite often. But we'll start with the question submitted for this. What scent did you wear on your birthday and was it planned? It wasn't planned. I, I pick scents on, on the mood I'm feeling that day. My birthday is November 2nd. I wore Sex Magic by House of Matriarch, which smells like... Uh, it's like a green forest, it's quite herbal, there's a little bit of cannabis, pine, cedar. It smells like a dark green forest with a little bit of black leather, it's quite aromatic. A very interesting and, un and unique. Yeah, it was a really good scent. I wore that on my birthday last year. Next question is, what is the most unique and complex fragrance you have tried? Uh, from the same house, House of Matriarch, I would probably say black number one, simply because I know it has 300 ingredients. 300 notes in a perfume is obviously ridiculously complex. I, I don't know any fragrance that is going to match that in complexity. That's another another level. So yeah, that's very complex. Although when you smell it, you could think it's simple because it smells like kind of black leather, it, but when you start really analysing it, you do pick out so many nuances. It is very, very complex. You've got black leather, you've got pines, you've got little herbal notes, little spicy notes, kind of just all these different things, little bits of spice. There's lots going on there. Uh, resins as well, I think. Very interesting fragrance. And I personally think it's unique, although it shares similarity with Sex Magic. It's unique outside of the House of Matriarch, if that makes sense. I don't know of any other fragrances other than Matriarch that do that kind of thing and as good as that. Half, uh, Ruby asks, if you had to live with only three fragrances for the rest of your life, what would they be? That's very difficult to answer because I don't want to go out. I don't want to go without a lot of them. <laughs> I, I'm going to say Tuscan Leather for one because that was my first love and I still love it and... I really wouldn't want to go without Tuscan leather. And I would say Kazemi by House of Matriarch. It's it really turned me on to rose. I, it's the best rose I've ever smelled. Period. I, it's just an incredible fragrance. It's dark. It's rich. It's it's woody. It's slightly spiced. It's just so rich. 
Um, I, I, I wouldn't want to go without Kazemi. I wear that a lot. I really enjoy it. I wore it a couple of days ago, and it lasts for ages, especially if you get it on a little bit on your top. It was like eight hours, and I was still smelling it. So really, really nice. I wouldn't go without that one. I'm going to try and pick one from different houses, so I'm not just <laughs> saying um, the same houses. Maybe I would cling on to by Killian Sacred Wood just because it's simplistic and it's nice to have something simple and sandalwood is my favorite note um, so I would say by Killian Sacred Wood it just smells of sandalwood I really enjoy sandalwood it's my favorite note in perfume it's comforting and just beautiful and, and rich so yeah those three Tuscan leather Kazemi Sacred Wood Tell us more about your family and background story, also Scent of the Day. Scent of the Day, I wore Madrona, it is by House of Matriarch, obviously it's my favourite house so I wear them all the time, <laughs> but it's uh, it's rich lavender, but it's like, it's like you get lavender, like raw lavender in the field that's dried in the sun and you crunch it in your hand. It's so aromatic, it's almost slightly spicy or smoked, just ever so slightly. The vetiver is, is rich and not the dirty variety of vetiver. It's, it's just a rich, warm vetiver with this uplifting, aromatic, wild, dry lavender. Uh, there's just a hint of what I thought was a, a violet note that comes through in the middle that just adds this kind of almost like a purpley kind of soft, sweet floral element but it's actually Oris. There's a little bit of Oris in there, but it works just like magic. I think it really, really goes well with the lavender. But I just, when, I, when I'm in the mood for a lavender kick, I wear Madrona. I think it's beautiful. Tell us about your family and background story. I mentioned briefly, I, I kind of got into this on the, in the first time that I did my Q&A, and it is difficult to talk about that topic my family is both um, wildly fantastic and devastatingly tragic at the same time uh, in some aspects I've come from a very fortunate family I don't want to say good family because it's got its dark sides but I come from a fortunate family where my grandparents were both very successful my dad's dad was actually a, a multi-millionaire very very successful owned a big company owned patents uh, you know um, very very a successful man uh, he died relatively young in his 50s uh, way before I was born and that money, all that money was split between seven of his sons, one of which was my dad. So my dad wasn't ever a millionaire. He, he just, although, you know, he, he was fortunate. He was obviously still relatively wealthy, but it was split between seven people. So it's not like my dad was super, super rich. But um, yeah, my dad in, became a hotelier. He was actually an accountant by trade, um, but he, he owned a hotel with my mum and got, obviously they got married uh, relatively young. And the hotel was big. It was a really big Victorian, old Victorian, I don't want to say mansion, but I mean it was a big Victorian house. Uh, they built a bungalow in the back garden and we owned another Victorian house across the road, which equally is pretty massive. And yeah, I mean, my family was quite wealthy back in the 70s, 80s. And I was born in 86. They still had the hotel uh, then. Um, my brother and my sister went to boarding school, not boarding school, private school. You know, where you, you pay every year to, for them to go to school. And my dad drove a Rolls Royce and things. I mean, it was quite fancy. They remember all that. They're quite, have a, had a privileged upbringing. I don't remember any of that because my dad became an alcoholic. He lost all his money and he left my mum when I was a baby. So I don't actually know my dad. I never knew him. 
he died when I was about 11 or 12 years old. Uh, he'd lost all his money, uh, died with nothing in a council flat. He, he literally had nothing left. Um, died of liver failure. I, I only have one memory of seeing him and he'd gotten jaund jaundice where his skin was going yellow because his liver was failing. That's the only, only memory I have of my father. Uh, so yeah, when he split with my mum, my mum bought a small, a small little business and she's been there ever since. So yeah, I, I went to a public school. I didn't have any fancy upbringing. My mum had a really embarrassing battered old car. Some, it was, I can't remember what it was now. I mean, it was ugly and just <laughs> a little bit embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I didn't get a silver spoon like my, my sister and brother did. I, I really didn't have that much growing up, um, but uh, I can't complain. I'm, I'm, I live in a, I grew up in a very nice area still, and we were comfortable. We were never uncomfortable, but I, I just didn't have the luxuries that my brother and sister were used to. But yeah, my other granddad was a bookbinder. And he did very well, very successful as well. So I guess I come from a good family. But my granddad died from drinking. He was an alcoholic as well. And um, my brother that I mentioned, he died of alcoholism. He was a severe alcoholic. I watched him go down, 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 downhill. He lost his career. Uh, just he, so many problems. And I'm not going to get into that because it is very personal and it's upsetting for me. And we had a difficult relationship and I mean there was days I was picking him up from the floor and ringing an ambulance because I didn't think he was breathing properly and I mean it was just really bad. He went to rehab for six months, uh, just nothing worked and uh, yeah he uh, he died from from excessive drinking. And my mum found him, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, we'll leave it at that. So yeah, I have a bit of a uh, interesting family. Uh, background story for me. Uh, I was very shy growing up as a kid, very quiet. I, I had a social anxiety, people talking to people would give me panic attacks and upset me and I was a very just hiding away and didn't take opportunities because I was scared. I got bullied in school quite a bit. I didn't really have many friends. Uh, I'm not saying this to feel sorry for me, really don't. I'm just, I'm just being open. I, I just had a lot of issues that took me a long time to get over and I didn't really overcome them until my brother passed away in 2012. And that's really what switched my brain because I was, I mean, I had to deal a lot. I'm not that I'm blaming him for my problems, but um, I think I also used his problems as an excuse for why I was bad uh, or, or why I was struggling is because I was dealing with so much, um, probably a cop out, but you know, you know what I mean? I, it's very hard to talk about things. And people, you're only getting pieces of a story. You're not, you're not understanding the years of of what actually happened, and you don't. You, so people kind of judge you and make their own conclusions, and they they weren't in the reality of it. So you, it's very difficult to talk about because people are only going to take grains of sand from this and and not understand the full picture. But yeah, I I had a lot of issues, and it took me years to get over it. And now I'm a lot better, and. It's taken me years to be the person I am now and be proud of who I am and and actually take opportunities and not be scared and do make you know make the most of things and, and not miss out on life. I, I'm being made aware of how fragile and how quickly life can go away because of how many people I've lost and the lives I've seen being destroyed. It makes you want to live a more fuller life and embrace the opportunities given rather than being afraid. 
Next question is, are you where you want to be in life, Peter? Are you happy with what you have been able to accomplish up to current? These are really deep questions, man. <laughs> uh, the honest answer to that is no. Although I'm not unhappy, um, I, I'm relatively happy. I'm not either sad or amazingly happy all the time. I, I'm just homeostasis. Uh, I learned that word from Big Big Bang Theory. <laughs> it's like balance. But uh, I mean, I think the problems that I had going up and, and for a long time, you know, in my early 20s, I couldn't even go to a supermarket or ring on a telephone. That's how messed up and, and damaged I was. So obviously I, I'm not where I want to be because I've wasted so many years of my life being stupid, being shy and quiet and not doing things because I was scared. So when I think about it that way, no, I, I'm not where I want to be in life because I, I, I shouldn't I shouldn't have wasted all those years. I'm only just starting to 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 get on it, to do what I want to do, and not be afraid of things. So I should be way more, you know, than I am now. But I've been a slow, late start. I'm only just now rolling the ball. So you know, am I happy? Relatively, yeah, relatively happy. I can't complain. I have a great job. Very lucky privileged and I would like to accomplish a lot more it's just a little bit slower than maybe it should have been next question is I know you are more of a private person and respect that but can you please tell us more about yourself and your background just on that and maybe how you got introduced into the world of perfumery or what made you dive into this sort of stuff and are you Planning on creating your own house, what advice would you give for someone thinking the same? So, uh, diving into perfume, I covered this in my fragrance horror stories, and uh, some people, <laughs> I've seen comments later, latterly that um, um, have taken snippets of what I said and twisted it and made it sound really out of context, um, but I'll refresh the story I'm sure people will take this one out of context as well but I had a, a girlfriend that wasn't it wasn't a good relationship in the end it, it just turned a little bit toxic she and I'm not I don't want to blame her it, we just weren't right for each other but at the time I didn't like any kind of fragrances I, I never I've never liked designer fragrances nothing snobby I just don't like the way they smell pure and simple but I was given all the time birthday, Christmas, bottles as presents. Never liked any of them. Anyway, this girlfriend complained that I never put any effort into smelling good for her. I never wore fragrances. She expected me to. So I was like, oh, actually, I, I have some in a drawer. Here they are. Showed, showed her them. And she pulled them dirtiest look, like of disgust. And I still remember it clear as day. And she refused flat out to even smell them. She was just like, made me feel this big. I was like, Jesus, like it was icy. Uh, <laughs> so I pretty much threw them all away and gave them away. And after we split up is when I decided I'm actually going to go out and find fragrances that I like. And the next time I have a girlfriend, I'll smell good. <laughs> and uh, that's, you know, I was Googling, um, actually... What I did was I was watching a lot of YouTube videos then, that's when I started watching YouTube and that's when I started researching fragrances and Fragrantica and all that and reading reviews and I was working out what I wanted to smell like so I put in, I just thought of leather, like some, something about leather in my mind uh, was more mature and sophisticated and sexy and something that sounded attractive and appealing to me of what I wanted to represent to the world of maybe a person who I'm I'm not yet because I was still a little bit shy and quiet but I wanted to project something better than myself and maybe that would help me get there a little bit quicker so I was googling what is the best leather fragrance Tuscan leather came up found it uh, from there is history uh, and are you planning on creating your own house yes I'm in the process of it it's getting there slowly. <laughs> Advice for people that are wanting to do the same as me. Um, 
think twice, think really carefully if it's what you want to do because it's not easy. I don't want to sound like I'm putting people off. If you want to do it, go for it. Always do something that you're excited about if you have the passion for it. But the warning is it's very expensive. The oils get very, very expensive. You need a good chunk of spare money to invest in buying what you need. Uh, it'll take up a lot of your time, a lot of your money. Um, what There's no easy way to learn. There's no really helpful information. There's no great books on helpful tips how to make perfume. There's very simplistic books maybe like Mandy Aftel, super, super basic, or you have on the opposite extreme, more these kind of chemistry books that are just ridiculously complex and don't actually tell you how to make a perfume. It just goes into the molecules and the chemistry behind it, which you don't really need to know. So there's no actual concrete. This is how you make a perfume. Uh, try your look on base notes, forums, and other indie perfumers and other people trying to learn is the best way. Um, it's just hard. You have to work it out by yourself. And if you're going to sell it, that's a whole other ball game. There's no helpful information on how to understand IFRA, how to get them tested, how to get them regulated, how to do it in within the law. There's just nowhere, nobody that can tell you what to do or how to do things properly. You just have to work stuff out on your own. It's a headache. It's complicated. It's a bit of a nightmare, if I'm honest. And when I learn it, I'm going to do my best to share uh, share that for free in, in my videos and to help other people because it is a fucking nightmare so that's my warning go for it if you want to but it is ex be prepared to spend money and to get a headache so there you go next question this is an easy one when is the next time you're going to make pizza's customized perfume giveaway that was a blast Thanks, I enjoyed that. I think it was a good challenge. Uh, I've still got Timmy's fragrance here. He's gonna get it soon. Um, I'm still, I sent him a sample basically and he gave me feedback and I need to adjust it slightly for him. Uh, Isabella got hers, she loved it. She wrote me a really nice message saying how much she enjoyed it. Um, Oz really enjoyed his, he reviewed it actually on his channel. Uh, so I'm super happy. That was a great challenge and something I'm really glad I did, but I'm not gonna be doing it often. Uh, just because I can't afford to the oils are expensive you know I was using genuine like real Mysore sandalwood real uh, Ylang Ylang absolutes real rose absolutes uh, real ambergris tincture I mean real oud the, these things are they're not cheap uh, believe me so it was quite expensive to do and then obviously I've got to post it and bottle it and label it uh, it's, it's, it gets expensive I can't afford to do that for free all the time so you know, that's going to be once in a blue moon kind of thing. But I'm glad I did it and it was cool. Simply simply Put Scents, uh, that's E from Simply Put Scents. I agree with you that many fragrances in the designer market smell the same. Sometimes I find that niche fragrances often repeat each other as well. If you were a perfumer for Dior, how would you make their fragrances unique but sellable? I agree, a lot of niche are copies of of different things and a little bit redundant and a lot of niche actually aren't very good quality I smell tons of cheap synthetics and a lot of niche even when they charge a high price they can still be real crap ingredients it's really actually I find it a little bit insulting to the customer and it's I guess playing on the ignorance of the general public don't know what they're smelling you know they, they can't tell what a synthetic is and what a natural is and what quality is They've got no reference. How would they if they don't buy all these hundreds of pounds worth of different oils to, to actually learn? So I think companies take advantage of the ignorance of that and, and they sell it on the fancy bottle and the nice name and the high price tag and the prestige of it rather than the quality of the juice. Uh, niche is far worse for that than designer. At least for designer, you, you, you know they're synthetic. But... Um, yeah, if I was a perf perfumer for Dior, how would I make their fragrances unique but sellable? Not a clue. Um, I think Dior do a pretty good job of, of what they do. I don't think they need to be any more particularly unique. I think they have a good range of fragrances and um, some of the stuff in their repertoire is, is very well respected and known. I Really, uh, how am I going to improve on that? <laughs> That's my answer. 
uh, what are in your, sorry next question is what's in your must buy list at the moment nothing but I have samples coming from different places so maybe I'll find something that I really enjoy and really want to own but nothing as of yet that I'm really super I really want to buy that anything that I've wanted recently I've, I've gone and bought myself already Next question is, when you go to Dubai Duty Free, how long is it before your flight? I'm guessing people want to know how long I have to smell, I guess, while I'm while I'm doing that. I have about two, two and a half hours in the airport before my flight. So at least two hours walking around duty free. So it's, I mean, there's plenty of time. I, I, I do take my time. If my nose gets tired, I, I just take a break, go around, look at other stuff, and maybe buy a couple of presents for people and then, and then go back to it and film a bit more. So... I have plenty of time. Kevin asks, Hi Peter, just wanted to know what are the primary things you look for in a fragrance out of all the reviews on YouTube? You seem to have the most selective taste. I agree, I'm probably the most fussy. <laughs> uh, I think the fussiness goes against me sometimes because when I do really like something, People seem to not believe me or they think that I'm lying or I'm being somehow paid to say something good because usually I don't. I don't understand the logic there. But like when I do really love something and gives a positive review, I'm almost uh, accused of, of not being genuine or something like and that kind of I don't know. I find that really weird. Uh, so maybe. I, I don't know. I mean, what's the opposite? I would just like everything. There's loads of reviewers that like everything. I, should I apologize for being picky? I, I like what I like. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, out of uh, what's the question? Yeah, primary things I look for in a fragrance. I don't look for anything in a fragrance. I, there's there's nothing in my mind that says okay, it needs this, this, and this to be a good fragrance that I'm interested in. If if it smells like quality and it trans... Wait, that's maybe the wrong word. I don't like cheap, cheap smelling synthetics. That's the only thing that turns me off. But I don't care if it's mixed media or if it's synthetic. I don't have anything against a lot of synthetics. It's just the ones that smell a certain way that, I don't, that I'm not keen on. But there's plenty of synthetics that smell fantastic. So, you know, I go in with an open mind. If it transports me somewhere like Tuscan leather, that is super synthetic. There's nothing natural in Tuscan leather. But I love it. It smells amazing. It just feels like me. Um, so it doesn't need anything in particular as long as it just takes me somewhere and, and makes me feel something. If it makes me feel something, that's a winner. George asks, uh, shouldn't the YouTube reviewers inform people about the quality of ingredients of brands? For example, isn't it hypocritical that some designer companies sell fragrances made with cheap ingredients while others use quality. So this, basically the whole topic George is talking about here is why don't reviewers talk about which houses use quality materials and which ones use really shit materials? And I think really, George, it boils down to uh, we really don't know uh, which companies use, you know, we presume Dior or Chanel use really good quality materials. And to a certain extent, you can smell that in, with your nose. You can smell that, yes, they are better quality than Paco Rabanne, for instance. But, you know, it's um, to some people, it might be subjective. Uh, we are just guessing at the end of the day because we're not the chemists that are creating it. We don't really know what goes into it. And to a certain extent, reviewers in general aren't privy to what they're smelling and not to be rude to reviewers. But really, you know, if a reviewer smells iris in a perfume, he's just going to say it smells of iris. You know, if you smell, if you, if, if I smell something with iris, I, I might say, okay, that's alpha ionone or that's iron alpha or that's oris divco, you know, but I've smelled loads of different oris synthetics and I know what the all different, they, they smell like. You know, most reviewers aren't, aren't privy to that because they've not spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds buying hundreds of different oils. I'm not saying that's a bad thing to reviewers, but I'm saying that's why reviewers don't really talk about what's quality and, and what's not quality because they really not... They know what they're smelling in terms of generalised notes, but they don't know what they're smelling in specific materials, raw materials and the difference between synthetic and, and real. And 
such. So that's a very complex uh, topic, but that's I, th I think basically why people don't do that. And also, it, I've learned from doing it myself that people can take it the wrong way. <laughs> if you say something is cheap or you know, people don't like that sometimes. People find that offensive. People don't like to be told their fragrance, their favorite fragrance has some cheap synthetic in, you know, some, you know, ignorance is bliss to a certain extent. It's, maybe it's better not to know what the raw materials are because then you can enjoy it for what it is rather than analyzing it and, and finding faults in something and it tainting your enjoyment of it. Because that's what happens to me. I, my enjoyment of a lot of fragrances is ruined because I, I all I can smell is is the cheap synthetics that I'm smelling, and I can't I can't enjoy the fragrance for what it is because I can only focus on what it is that I recognise. You know, it's it's difficult, and um, in some respects, I, I wish I'd, I I didn't know all these materials because I would probably enjoy fragrances a lot more than I do. Uh, Tammy asks, what notes, especially unusual or lesser used ones, would you like to see used more often in newer perfume releases? I'm a bit sick of this trend of everything being really oversweet. I'm noticing a couple of trends. We have super sweet, over the top, bubble gum, candy, super sweet vanilla, just everything just diabetic. And then there's another trend at the moment of very earthy, materials like mineral and, and rock and soil you know and, and green uh, is they're, they're coming back to like i don't know more of an earthy kind of element these you know rocks and soil and concrete and all these things i i would like to see a different direction into more herbs like sage like i tried the the sage and absinthe and i thought that was quite a refreshing change a little bit different and it smelled really nice I would like to see more along the lines of, of that, you know, notes like absinthe or, or like I say, sage, more herbal um, elements, uh, I think it, it would be quite nice. Uh, next question is, what's the best summer designer fragrance in your opinion for men and women? Uh, see, I'm the wrong person to ask for designer fragrances because I don't enjoy basically all of them. I mean, I, I wear Narciso Rodriguez EDP for him. I think you can wear that in the summer just fine. It's a light kind of floral musk, quite modern smelling, but it's not too heavy or thick. It is quite light, so I do think it would work in the summer, but ideally it's more of a spring fragrance for me. The women's version of that, I like the EDT version for women in the black bottle with the pink writing. That's beautiful. Again, more spring, but I, I think you can pull it off in summer with fewer sprays because it's not too heavy. But I really like Dolce Gabbana's The One Rose. I don't know if you would typically call it a summer fragrance, but it's it's light, it's not heavy, it's not super sweet. It's just this kind of beautiful pink, soft, feminine rose that I think would work fine in the summer, but I think personally it's quite beautiful and very pretty. And I'd love to smell that on a woman any kind of year, any time of year. <laughs> Okay, next question, Mr. Carter, you're very creative of your content and I applaud you for it. Just want to know how you developed your interest in fragrance. Also, what was the very first bottle you purchased? Thanks for the great unique content. That's from Scott. Thanks, that's more compliments than I deserve probably. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the interest in fragrance, like I say, the, the ex-girlfriend thing kind of pushed me into finding things that I liked. Um, also, what was the very first bottle you purchased? Okay, ones that I purchased myself uh, was um, Allure, Chanel Allure Eau de Extreme, or whatever the hell it's called, the extreme version of the Allure. Jeremy talks about it a lot, a lot of people do. I bought that one, and at the same time I bought uh, Yves Saint Laurent's La Nuit de l'Homme. Both I don't own anymore. I like Lanry de Lom, it just doesn't didn't last on my skin. If I had a really old formulation, I'd, I would keep it and wear it, but I'm not going to go out of my way to buy that vintage bottle. Uh, I, I'm past that, but I, I, th I do think it's a nice scent, actually, for a designer fragrance, very good. 
if you've got one that lasts on you, I think that's fantastic. For me, just uh, I can't be bothered to go out and buy an old one. The new ones just suck. Uh, the Allure O Extreme. I enjoyed it when I first smelled it, and then it just started smelling super synthetic and kind of a little bit weirdly metallic, almost like the bottle looks. I think it was just the way the tonku was mixing with the other notes in there just made it a little bit too... It was grating on me. This, the backbone of the sweetness just uh, rubbed me the wrong way. I'd, I had to get rid of that one. But those were the first two I bought. The first niche I bought was Tuscan Leather. Next question is from The Broadwalk. If you've not checked her channel out, I think she's awesome. A link in the description to her. I want to give her a shout out. I was watching a couple of her videos uh, yesterday and the day before and she's fun to watch. She's so chatty and positive and and confident and just really cool. She she would be like everybody's friend, like everybody would like to be friends with her. She's so easy to watch and yeah, check her out. She's really cool. And she asked, what's the last full bottle you purchased? That was from House of Matriarch and I purchased one called Sacri Tabac Sukli. Something like that. It's, <laughs> it's, it smells like apple shisha. So like an apple hooker pipe. It's got this beautiful... Uh, like cloudy apple notes with this tobacco that's not quite like any tobacco I've smoked before because I'm not really into tobacco in fragrances but this one is really nice but the way it blends with the apple I don't know it just I felt like it really suited me and it just smelled really good to me so I purchased a full bottle of that after sampling and that's going to be on its way so that was the last one I bought and do you have any in your to buy list because you are the most curated collection and more selective uh, no, nothing apart from ones I've already just like bought. I, I don't have anything to buy in the future yet. I do have samples coming. Matriarch have just released or have released uh, a few new fragrances like um, Sacre Noir, which is the second one from Joseph Sagona. It's like a holiday fragrance based around the idea of holly. And it sounds really interesting. There's a plum accord to that as well, I guess, similar to the longing. Um, but it's more like a green forest and woody and resinous and uh, it sounds really interesting and I know a couple of others as well there's been a few new releases from Matriarch so I, I bought all those samples myself those are going to be on the way and I've got samples from I bought samples from the zoologist website last night of the new releases like elephant um, I've got samples coming from Fort Manley, the, the Australian house, like, uh, you know, the Confessions of a Garden Gnome uh, that Pep talked about. Check out Pep if you've not checked out the Sentinel, another great guy. Um, so I have samples coming. We'll see. There might be something I want to buy. How's the fragrance? She also asks, how's the fragrance line going? If you could create a scent based on your personal music idol, who would it be? What would it smell like? That's a great question. Thank you. I think that's uh, probably the best question I've been asked. So how's my fragrance line going? It's hit a bit of a bump. The company that I buy the majority of my oils from has closed down. That's kind of screwed me a little bit. Um, they're moving to Europe. They're not going to be open for maybe six months. And they're only going to be selling naturals. That's not a bad thing. I can still buy my naturals from them. But I kind of have to find alternative sources for the synthetics that I was buying from them. Because... I do make mixed media perfumes. They are more more natural, but they do have some synthetics. Uh, but yeah, I'm kind of having to resource everything, which is a nightmare and a headache and a bit frustrating. Um, but we'll work it out, I'm sure. <laughs> and obviously, I've been away six months offshore working this year, so that means I'm six months delayed on time I could have been progressing with this. We're creating my own house, so man, it, it could be it could be like a year before I'm ready now. With having to find a new source for materials and being delayed with working so much, I'm not, and I don't want to rush it either. I'm not in a rush. I want to do things properly, and I want to be completely happy with what I make. So it will be ready when it's ready. There's no time limit on it for me. It's going well though. I'm I'm happy with with what I'm making. I think they're smelling really good. And I've, I've, I've sent samples off to reviewers and friends and, and people 
on YouTube and I've had really positive, really good feedback. So that's, that's great. And music idols, I have a few music idols. If we go back to the very first, it was Metallica with James Hetfield. He's the reason I play guitar. I was fortunate enough to go see them live, really close to the stage. And best show I've ever been to in my life. It was intense, it was amazing, such really good energy. James Hetfield was flicking guitar picks at the end, plectrums. I think he flicked maybe three of them, he didn't have many. And I'm not kidding, he looked at me from like over there, he just looked at me. And he flicked it right at me with his thumb. I, I didn't even move my hand, my hands were just up and it landed in the middle of my palm and I was just in shock. Like I, I couldn't believe it, I was like, I've just caught James Hetfield's guitar pick. It was like, and I've taped it to my ticket, I still got it. Uh, he was just my inspiration completely. Um, yeah. So what would his fragrance smell like? If we go back to old school Metallica from the 80s, they were known as Alcoholica. They drank a lot of booze. So I think it would have to use notes of probably whiskey, tobacco, maybe even a little bit of cannabis. I don't know. I'm pretty sure they probably did a bit of fair drugs in their time. I, I don't know what cocaine smells like. Tuscan leather gets compared to cocaine. I would have no idea. But some kind of narcotic thing smell in there probably. Black leather because they wore, you know, leather boots, leather jackets, uh, leather guitar straps, uh, some kind of dark wood for the like the mahogany body of the guitars. I think that would work. Leather, dark wood, whiskey, tobacco, maybe a little bit of spice. That would be Metallica. Uh, Jimi Hendrix is another big inspiration for me in terms of guitar and uh, and just the way he revolutionized the guitar playing, the electric guitar, I, I, uh, and I just love his music. And he obviously, he grew up in, or he was around in the 60s, the hippie era. He was very free-spirited and, and, and didn't really class himself as any particular group or member of any anything, any country even. He was just a person of the universe. And I think, bearing that in mind, patchouli was big in the 60s. I think maybe something with a little bit of patchouli. Again, maybe some dark woods. So I think maybe a little bit of patchouli, maybe a cannabis note, because, you know, in the 60s everyone was getting high. Hendrix, no exception. Cannabis, patchouli, woods. I think it would be quite an earthy kind of fragrance. Um... I think that would work for Jimi Hendrix. And we'll do a women's one as well, because I, to, to, to make it a little bit fair, <laughs> I have loads of, uh, of inspiration from women. There's so many amazing artists. One that I listen to quite often is, is Lana Del Rey. Her voice is very soothing to me. I, I, she just chills me out and very easy listening. And she's just, I don't know, I really like her music. Her, her melancholiness, she's got a very kind of droll voice, um, but then she's got these beautiful high notes as well, and I, I enjoy her lyric writing. She's a little bit different. I, I like that she's in control of her own image, and she, she selects all these old video footages that she puts in her music videos, and she knows what she's she likes, and she creates her own world around herself. She's got really twisted, dark lyrics when you listen to them properly. She's quite sexual and provocative as well. But that just makes me more kind of fascinated around her, I think. I think she's just... And she's a very beautiful girl. She's she's gorgeous. And, yeah, some of her lyrics, like, um, My Pussy Tastes Like Pepsi Cola is one of them. I don't know of any other singer <laughs> that would dare sing that. <laughs> My Pussy Tastes Like Pepsi Cola... My eyes are wide like cherry pies. I've got a taste for men who are older. It's always been, so it's no surprise, is the lyrics to that song. She's got another song called Gods and Monsters. And the lyrics to that one go, In the land of gods and monsters, I was an angel looking to get fucked hard. She's a little bit kinky. <laughs> I can think of a few more just examples of, of her kind of twisted, kind of dark side. 
but um, yeah, I find her quite fascinating. Her music's beautiful. And her fragrance, because she's so beautiful, I think it would have to be a very pretty feminine fragrance. I think it would use the note of rose. I think it would maybe a little rose, a little bit of a langy lang because she's smooth and it's a little sweet, uh, a little bit of vanilla, not too much. Uh, she she goes to the front row after the gig and takes pictures and signs autographs. She's super nice to her fans. That's why I say she's sweet. So a little bit of vanilla, rose, ylang ylang, sandalwood, because uh, she's got complexity to her. She's not just simple. She's got a little bit of a personality there. Uh, yeah, I think that would smell pretty damn good. Sandalwood, rose, ylang ylang, just a touch of vanilla. And because she's a little bit fiery and a little bit of a dirty mind, um, just from those lyrics you can tell she's a bit sexy maybe a little bit of pink pepper just to add a little bit of fire to it so I think I think that's cool uh, the last question I think this is the last question I like to create perfumes as a hobby like yourself I know you've just started and don't particularly like pre-made blends that smell like entire accords because they're typically very cheap and it's like cheating however what's your opinion on these blends that are entirely natural for example Robert A has many natural accords such as apple, apricot, and either even a nice leather accord. What's your thoughts on this and their usage? Well, um, that is hard to answer, Justin, because it makes me sound a little bit hypocritical if I say <coughs> um, it's okay to do it for one and not the other. I think what creams my corn more is that, like you say, because it's cheap, that it feels like not only are you cheating, but you're also robbing the customer. If it's a pre-made accord that's made of quality natural materials, you're not really robbing the customer, it's still quality. It's just kind of done for you. I'm not sure I would personally use them, because like I say, it does feel a little bit like cheating, but then if you look at it a different way, it's made from naturals, it smells nice, you're using, you know, the most of a palette that's available. I, I would have no problem with other people using them, and I'm not sure quite how I feel, really. Um, I don't know. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's better that they're natural, like I say, because you, it doesn't feel like you're then robbing a customer, um, because it's still quality. It's just a little bit of the work's been done for you. Whether or not that's a bad thing, I'm not sure. Um, down to the individual. That's it. I, I don't think I missed any questions. I think I've answered them all. If I haven't, I'm sorry. Um, I will see you in the next video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope the video wasn't too long and boring. Uh, I we did get kind of personal and a little bit, uh, I guess, deep in certain places for a fragrance channel. I am pretty honest and open take me how you want if if you decide you don't like me that's quite fine i'm just going to be myself and you you can like it or not basically i'm afraid i i don't see the point in pretending to be pretending to be something or pretending in general you know just be yourself be comfortable with with people i'm i'm quite happy sharing that and if you want to judge me you go ahead and judge but you know people judge without knowing a full story people are quick to make assumptions and think they know somebody and think they they know and and they don't they they know like a grain of sand in all this information and they're just selecting a little bit and you don't really get the full unless you've lived it you can't really judge people life is very complicated everyone's got shit in the closet that's you know it is what it is if you're going through a rough time or I've said something that you've related to you know I just want you to know that uh, I've gone over a lot of my personal problems and it's not impossible and with time you can get there too if you're lucky and you you've had a great life then you're very blessed a lot of us go through a lot of shit but there are a lot of people that have gone through a lot worse and so much worse, you only have to look at the news and man, it's, you know, the world is a little bit scary sometimes. 
but we have to keep positive and we have to move forward and we yeah we we carry on i will see you in the next video take care guys uh see you very soon bye bye